Welcome to Cult Free Radio. Tonight is our celebration of Independence 2011. I'm your host, Mad Sweeney, and tonight we have several guest interviews and a discussion of freedom and independence that will show our audience that there is indeed life after leaving the Watchtower Society and that the future looks bright for people who have escaped from the Borg. But first, I have a little scheduling announcement. As uh, many of you know, I've been, since April, doing a live show every two weeks on Saturday night at 10 p.m., and tonight is the sixth installment of Cult Free Radio, and after tonight's show, I am going to take a little bit of a summer vacation. I hope to take a couple of months off from live shows and work on preparing for and recording some tracks for the fall season of Cult Free Radio. And the next live Cult Free Radio show will be on September 10. And at least part of that discussion will be about the Watchtower study article about apostates that will be studied in kingdom halls around the world the next day, the 11th. Uh, the article is entitled, Will You Heed Jehovah's Clear Warnings? Um, so that will be part of the September 10th show, which we th- will be the next live Cult Free Radio after this one. And... We'll probably also line up a guest or two for that show as well. Uh, You know, that article, just a little bit of a preview in case you're not familiar with it, it's the July 15th Kool-Aid edition, uh, the study edition of the Watchtower. And the article compares apostates to smugglers, forgers, uh, mentally diseased and contagious with the goal of infecting others with disloyal teachings, Liars, malicious slanderers, and so on. So I plan to uh, go through that article, analyze the loaded language that they use, and see if we can't uh, tease out and articulate the phobia indoctrination that's going on throughout that article. Also in the meantime, over the next couple months, I hope to work out some sort of hosting site for the recordings of Cult Free Radio that easy a lot, easily allows downloading of the shows so that you can save them on your iPod and listen at your own convenience. Uh, Anything on the Internet is downloadable if you know how and have the right software, but downloading from Ustream isn't easy or intuitive because Ustream isn't really designed for that sort of thing. It's really designed for live stuff, Uh, and it may not even be allowed by Ustream anyway, except for by the content owner, which is me. So I can download the stuff. I am going to find a host somewhere to host the cult-free radio shows that have already been recorded and the future ones that we will continue to record. Uh, I'll try to do some sound editing where necessary to even out the volume. And... Uh, then I'll get them on a hosting site as MP3 so that you can carry cult-free radio on your iPod or on your phone. And uh, one more bit of information before I jump into the topic for tonight. If you've already friended me on Facebook, you probably saw that uh, I've made myself a cult-free radio t-shirt. Now, I haven't really figured out a distribution method to get them to people who want them, and I don't want to make money from selling them. So uh, I welcome your ideas on a practical way to go about providing a cult-free radio t-shirt for whoever wants one uh, without making money and also without going broke buying boxes and boxes of t-shirts. So (laughs) some way that we can uh, work out getting the t-shirts to the people who want that. We can discuss that on the Facebook page if you've got some good ideas. All the ideas I've come up with so far seem kind of 
awkward. So I'm sure you all have something uh, practical that you could advise me with. Now, it's Independence Day, or at least it was, on July 4th. And it was just a few days ago, and I spent that day with a group of former cult members, former Jehovah's Witnesses, celebrating our freedom from the religion and our independence from cult influence. So while eating burgers and hot dogs and playing with Smurf dolls, I was able to take some time to talk with several of the guests there at uh, Jim Moon's 4th of July Barbecue Bash. And we talked about their lives in and out of the Watchtower and their experiences with the transition from cult member to a free citizen of the world. And so tonight I'm going to play some of those interviews I recorded and I'll make some comments uh, in between each of them. And I'll also give my own personal experience as well. Uh, and when mine comes up, I'll play a portion of a pre-recorded introduction I did to myself back in April before I began Cult Free Radio. And then I'll add some further details about my experience as a uh, member of Jehovah's Witnesses and my exit from the group. I'll probably include that scattered in between some of the uh, recorded interviews. So, without further ado, here is the first discussion from our Independence Day bash. And I believe on the recording, our guest introduces himself. It's July 4, 2011, Independence Day. This is Mad Sweeney at Jim Moon's Independence Day Bash. And I am talking to... Ruben. Ruben. Ruben, seeing how it's Independence Day, uh, one of the things I'd like to focus on for this Cult Free Radio show is freedom. And uh, if for those who have listened to the previous shows, I tend to uh, talk a lot about... Steve Hassan's bite model of mind control that cults use is B for behavior control, I for information control, T for thought control, and E for emotional control. And um, I've gone over basically what all that means in previous shows. But I wanted to talk to as many people today who have left the Jehovah's Witness cult about the freedom that you've found and how it relates to bite. For instance, while you were a Jehovah's Witness, what sorts of behaviors did you feel that they controlled in your life? How did they influence the way you thought and felt about things? What sort of information were you denied access to? And now, on the flip side of that, right. what kind of freedom do you have to do what you want to do? What sort of information are you into? What do you like learning about, thinking about? And and how does that inform your life now that you've been freed from the cult? Well, one of the things that they deny you is is looking into other um, other information, other religions, other um, philosophies. They discouraged all that. They what they said was check out what we have to say. Look at our information. Uh, if you want to learn about um, other religions, you need to read our book, Searching for, I forgot what it was called, Searching for... Man's, mankind's, mankind's Search, search for, God. for God. Yeah, yeah. You know, in their version, and then at the end they tell you, oh, well, this is this is what, what um, the conclusion you should arrive. Uh, but um, now I'm free to investigate um, other religions. I'm free to read uh, different different thoughts different philosophers and enjoy it and I, I, I do I mean I'm not a, I'm a non-believer I, I do not believe in God but um, I still am interested in reading what other people have to say on the subject and I, and that's one of the pastimes I have now that at that time as Joe's witness you're not allowed to have I really enjoy it cool thanks if were you uh, raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses? Yes, from the age of six years old. Okay. They came knocking on our door thanks to my sisters. Uh, my sisters were at school, and a girl at school preached to my sister, and they were teenagers. So they started studying the Bible with my sister, and then the per that person's parents came and started studying with my mother. And I was riding my tricycle around the table, 
and going la 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 while they were having Bible study. My mom pulled me by the ear, sat me down, and I gotta say, from that point, I was hooked. I liked the, I liked the, uh, I liked the way they studied with my mother. Um, so that's how it started at that age. And so, do you feel that um, maybe your emotions were manipulated at a young age to say? Uh, give a right answer, you were given certain praise, give a non-book answer or ask a non-book question, <laughs> you were given a different type of response? Yeah, well, it, you know how they they did, they would um, encourage you to answer in your, uh, don't read it, say it in your own words. You know? So you you learn to take what they say and internalize it. Mm -hmm. uh, when they do that, you're internalizing it, you're making it as they say, even they use that expression, making it your own. Right, right. So, and from early childhood, you know, they were teaching me to make that my own. Yeah. So for me, it wasn't something that was pu pulled down my throat. It kind of like, it kind of caught my attention from an early age. So I, I know I recognize now the techniques they used. And I could recognize it now. Um, other groups they use it too, not only religious but outside of that, you know, the pyramid schemes, things like that, they use the same model. But I, I was hooked from a very early age. So it wasn't something that had to be forced. You have to go to the meetings. Right. I right. wanted to go. Yeah. Because I believed it. And you were baptized at what age? I was baptized at 16 years old. Okay. And were you uh, discouraged from uh, furthering your education after yes, high school? Definitely. Um, I was discouraged from, not by my mother, but by the literature. Mm -hmm. I was a, um, I had a, I'll, I'm going to start a little back. Sure. Okay. Um, at 14, I wanted to get baptized. But my mother was a kind of liberal witness that was, wanted, didn't want me to get baptized at that age. She said, you got to wait. Because uh, you're a little too young, which I s knew people that were getting baptized at 11 mm -hmm. and 10, and I was like, oh, I can't get baptized. I pass mics. I do this. They use me a lot here. So she wanted me to wait. So I, at 16, even though that's young, you know, I, I should have waited, but I, I was determined. I worked two years for it, so I had to prove it. And um, so when I finished high school, I did go to college. I went to a community college, started going even though it was discouraged. But what, hap what ended up happening was, at the age of, um, I was engaged to a girl. She broke it off. I was um, very depressed after that. And uh, at all, while all this is happening, I was a ministerial servant. And also, I live with my mother and two nieces, and I was supporting them. So I kind of had, at an early age, to do to support a family. So I was working full time. I was going to school full time. And I was a ministerial servant. Wow. Full time. At, at this time you're like nineteen, twenty, something like that. I was twenty uh twenty named ministerial servant. So um and I I was going to school. I ended up having a heart attack at twenty two. And it didn't it wasn't it wasn't um I wasn't sick. I didn't have cholesterol or, or, or blockage. It was it was stress. It's too much. Wow. So, what was I to do? What could I give up? Was I going to give up my spirituality, a ministerial servant? I couldn't give up working full time, supporting a family that I was responsible. So I did what the society recommended: put spiritual things first. You quit school. So I quit school. Yeah. Interesting. Well, now uh, looking back at the different things that have happened to you and that you have uh, lived through while you were one of Jehovah's Witnesses. How long have you been out of the organization? I left in 2004. Okay, so about five, six, six, well, six, six or seven years Yes, now. yeah. <laughs> Time flies. And so now you've had several years out of the organization. What sorts of things do you enjoy now? that you weren't able to then? Have you gone back uh, to school, for instance? 
No, I have not gone back to school, but I'm planning to go back this year. <laughs> Excellent. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, I've been fortunate enough where I have a job that usually you do need a higher education, but, you know, with the two years that I have, you know, and plus the experience. But I do want to get it. I just want to have that security mm -hmm. under the belt. So that's my plan for the fall. And um, I do lots of things. And one of the things I love doing is traveling going around different places and meeting new people mm -hmm. and as Joe has witnessed your schedule is so tight you, you don't have the opportunity to do that and you have these skimpy vacations and sometimes during your vacation you make plans to go to meetings right and um, it's a time it takes it's unnecessary time mm -hmm. wasted yeah, and any money that you might have used on a hotel for your vacation, you've spent on hotels for assemblies. Right. <laughs> three times a year, unless you happen to live in the assembly town. Yeah. You know? So, uh, yeah, I remember that, that those expenses and time, and you've already taken your time off from work for those sorts of things, so, so it's hard to get leave for a, a vacation as well. You mentioned that uh, now that you're out, you enjoy reading other things that uh, you weren't necessarily able to read while you were a witness because it might have been frowned on or something. What, what's your favorite book right now? Um, I'm or, into, or lately that you've read? What, what are you into right I'm now? into Bart Ehrman. Cool. Uh, I, I, I love his books. Um, I just finished Jesus Interrupted. Excellent. Um, uh, there's some other books I want to read of his, but that's uh, right now I'm kind of reading his books. Excellent. I also get to read, um, my wife's getting me into uh, Chuck Palahniuk. What, that yeah, he's I'm the one, the writer of uh, Fight Club. Oh, okay, yeah. And yeah. He's, a, he's a pretty demented guy. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, he, the way his writing style, you yep, know, yep. these are things that, you know, you were, you would never read mm -hmm. as a Jehovah's Witness, but you get to now. Um, I also do a lot of time, um, spend a lot of time in activism online. I don't have a, sh a radio show, <laughs> but uh, I, I have a um, support group, and um, we go around and meet a lot of the people in our support cool. group. What's um, the name of it? It's an ex Jehovah's Witness Recovery Three. Excellent. It's the third one. I've been doing the, I've been doing it for uh, since 2006. Excellent. So you got right on it when you left the organization. Well, well yeah, right right afterwards. It, it helped me as I learned from everybody else, mm -hmm. even even when we disagreed. Because I was able to disagree with people and remain friends with them, even though we completely differed in views. How's that different from when you were in the organization? When you're in the organization, if you differ from if, if they differ from you, they stay away from you. They avoid you like the plague. I could probably say right now, I'm like, well, this person believes in this, this person believes in that. But man, I love that guy. He's my friend. It, it, and and we could discuss a, an issue, and I'd be completely disagree with him. And I'm like, you're crazy. I, how, I, you say I'm crazy, but but then at the end of the day, we can like chill, have a drink, hang out. No shunning. No shunning. <laughs> awesome. Exactly. Well, thanks, Ruben. I appreciate you spending a little time with Cult Free Radio this oh, evening. No problem. And, um, it was great meeting you. You too. You too. This this is a really good opportunity here at uh, Jim Moon's. Independence Day, Fourth of July barbecue to, uh, like you said, meet a diverse group of people who believe and think a lot of different things, but um, we have one thing in common, and that's yes. we're free from the Watchtower Society. Exactly. And uh, this is my fourth year here, and um, and next year, anybody wants to come, I'll be here next year as well. Awesome. Um, I'm here every year since 2008. Great. And I support Jim Moon. He's a really good guy, and I'm glad to meet you. You too, Ruben. Thank you. All right. And that was Ruben, our first uh, person to share his experiences with being a Jehovah's Witness and exiting from the Watchtower Society as well. Now, a couple of things that um, stand out there is um, the sound in the background. Uh, you must have heard the uh, chatter. It was uh, a very fun and happy and positive occasion with uh, everybody associating and mingling and having a good time. But it was also a, a really uh, clean environment. There was no uh, anger or bitterness or any of the stuff that the Watchtower tries to scare people with about 
a group of former Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so I really appreciate uh, Ruben speaking with Cult Free Radio, speaking with me, and uh, and Jim for hosting because it, it was a really good time. Um, during the week, I had asked for on a couple of message boards and also on some of the Facebook groups for other comments on tonight's topic about uh, freedom from the Borg and how people are feeling, how they felt uh, during the exit or after the exit or whatever. And uh, I'd like to share a couple of those in between our pre-recorded interviews. And so one of the responses I got said... A little over a year ago, I was watching a program on TLC about cults. I was actually mad that they included Jehovah's Witnesses in that. I turned off the show, but then started thinking about how many times I had heard that, and had only taken the society's definition of cult. So I decided to look up the word on the Internet. I found numerous sites that defined it without necessarily calling any one religion a cult. One site, specifically, I sent an email to the writers asking if they were ex-Jehovah's Witnesses because their way of defining cults seemed so specific to the Jehovah's Witness teachings. They actually wrote back and said, nope, none of us are Jehovah's Witnesses, but most cults use similar tactics. After that, I knew Jehovah's Witnesses were a cult. I didn't go to another meeting after that because I wanted to see if absence would unfog my mind, and it did. And Steve Hassan's book on cult mind control, page 54, says, Perhaps the biggest problem faced by people who have left destructive cults is the disruption of their own identity. They have lived for years inside an artificial identity given to them by the cult. I feel like I spent my life trying to be someone I wasn't. Now I embrace my authentic self and feel comfortable in my own skin. I like who I am for the first time in my life. I'm happy and contented and feel panicked whenever I think of returning. I will never go back. Thank you for that comment as well. I uh, told the people on the message board that I would keep them anonymous, and so I will. But you know who you are, and thank you for sharing that with us. And you can hear the same sort of tone as we heard in Ruben's conversation. Uh... Not bitterness, not anger, but relief and happiness to be out of the group, out of the organization of the Watchtower. Now, let's listen to our next voice of independence and freedom from Jim Moon's 4th of July Independence Day bash. Well, welcome back to Cult Free Radio. This is Mad Sweeney, your host. It is July 4, 2011, Independence Day, and we are at Jim Moon's Independence Day Barbecue Bash for former Jehovah's Witnesses. And I'm here with... Lisa. Well, welcome, Lisa, to Cult Free Radio. You having a good time so far today? Wonderful time. Awesome. Me too. It's a really nice and diverse crowd. Um, what we've been talking about with some of the guests here today at Jim's place is freedom and independence. And all of us have the same shared experience of being uh, former members of Jehovah's Witnesses, which is under the Watchtower Society. And I've been talking to people a little bit about the background and experiences as witnesses and some of the ways in which... As a member, we lacked freedom, uh, freedom of our mind, freedom to access certain information. Uh, We lacked the freedom to do certain things, participate in certain events, and to even there was control exercised over the way we think and feel about everyday things, that people take those freedoms for granted. So I've been talking about those sorts of things and how we've discovered our freedom and what we enjoy about being free today. So to start with, Lisa, let's talk a little bit about uh, when you first became one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Were you born in, raised? I was raised in from the age of two on. Okay. And how old were you when you got baptized? I got baptized when I was 14. 14 years old. So as you were growing up, 
did you feel at um, did you feel at the time like you were missing out on certain things, like um, you were deprived of certain freedoms? And looking back now, do you feel like you were? Well, I felt like I was missing out on things, but I thought it was because I had something wrong with me that I couldn't hate those things. Like I was supposed to. Mm-hmm. Things such as holidays, for instance, birthday I loved parties. Looking at the trees and when we drove by, but we were supposed to look away. Things like that. Right. And so you were taught that you were supposed to not envy those things or not desire them, but yet was there was still something inside that kind of did. Yes, very much so. Okay. And so when you were 14, you were baptized, you became dedicated to the organization. And did you have aspirations for perhaps higher education or anything at that time? Um, I thought we were so close to the end that I didn't really need a higher education, so I didn't pursue one. Okay. And what do you think gave you that idea? Well, I was told I would be dead before I ever graduated high school. And even when they offered me a scholarship, I didn't think I'd ever make it through college, so I didn't take the scholarship. Mm -hmm. I... um remember when I was very small uh, my family my mom and my sister would refer back to the 1969 awake that told young people at the time that they would never uh, grow old enough to have a career in this system of course I was a toddler then so they told me I would probably never even graduate from school and um, so I also didn't really even consider higher education even though those opportunities were there so you remained a Jehovah's Witness for how long into your adult life? Um, till I was 1984, 85, probably the last time I went to a meeting. Okay. Was there anything specific that um, maybe sort of changed your outlook or your viewpoint about the organization, about the, the um, maybe the doctrine, but even more specifically about their methods of of control and how it relates to independence and freedom? Um, I was disfellowship more than once for the same crime, even though I went and told on myself, so, and they would have never known if I hadn't told on myself. Um, and then I decided it wasn't worth it. You know, I told them everything that they I, they wanted to know, even though I answered all their questions, and I was still disfellowship, which I thought was odd, because I thought if you confessed, that would be all right, but it wasn't. Hmm. So confession doesn't to them uh, indicate any sort of uh, repentance, apparently. Right, and they and they said they wanted to use me as an example. They actually said that? Yes. Wow. Okay, so that way other people wouldn't do... Would be very this, Right. <laughs> so, and this, this, again, it relates back to uh, what I like to mention on the show a lot is about the, uh, the mind control that the organization uses as a... Uh, the simplified way that uh, Steve Hassan describes it with the acronym BITE, B-I-T-E, for behavior, information, thoughts, and emotion. And either it starts with information that they either give you or don't let you have access to, or it tends to start with emotion like fear or guilt. Right. And so at that point, you were out of the organization. Did you still believe? I still believe, but I thought for sure Armageddon was coming in a short period of time. So I just wanted to ha be as happy as I possibly could with my children, live a good life for a short period we had time left. So I just got a little wild, but I just got wild making more money so I could take and do things with my kids. Okay. And what did you feel at that time was going to happen to you when Armageddon came? Oh, I would be destroyed. I had no doubt. Okay. And so since then... Obviously, you're, at that time, you were free physically from the organization, but mentally you still had some of these traps still on. How did you manage to break free in your mind? Um, the first thing that helped me break free was that I got a job working in a bar, and I could talk to everybody about anything I wanted to, and they would answer me, maybe because they were drinking. And, but I was really opened my eyes. I mean, I was amazed at how nice people were and, you know, really good people that were out there. I notice in the organization there's a lot of um, what psychologists call loaded language, and um, you just reminded me of one big loaded word that uh, the Watchtower uses. It's worldly and worldly people, and that also relates to the fear. It's a trigger mechanism. When you hear the word, word worldly or you see a person and you label them worldly, you're naturally afraid of them. You're afraid of their negative influence on your spirituality, which 
we know now, spirituality is code word for your relationship with the organization. And so you got to see that worldly people weren't worldly. They were what I like to call now normal. Right. Right. And so that job helped you to start to see that. And so at that point, did you um, start doing some research into the organization or any sort of reading, or was it mostly word of mouth and just talking to people? You know, I think at that time I still had other issues, like low self-esteem and stuff like that. So this job working in a bar, which was an adult bar, um, I think that helped um, mm-hmm. because then I was getting flattered and I was getting paid money, and so that was pretty cool. So I kept doing that. It wasn't until in my 30s when we got a computer that I really started researching the doctrine and found out how much crap it was, and maybe I wasn't going to die after all, at least not so soon. Excellent. And so did you find that, um, in your experience, the Internet was a really big help uh, in an education tool? Oh, definitely. As soon as I knew that there were other people like me, that helped. And that's another uh, sort of... uh, fear factor do you think that the organization puts on people that when you are disfellowshipped or if you leave of your own accord that um, you're going to be alone yes and so you got to see there are normal people in the world and that there are not only just normal people uh, there are people like us who used to be Jehovah's Witnesses and do you feel like in your experiences on the internet that you have found um that the internet is maybe you might say a a danger to the Watchtower Society? I think it's a danger to anybody that's not being honest about their product. That's an excellent way to put it. That's an excellent way to put it because the truth will out. I, I think about even business models such as eBay where it's really uh, self policing via the feedback method you rip off too many of your customers, you're going to get too much negative feedback and nobody's going to buy from you anymore. Exactly. And so do you think that relates to the Watchtower organization in a similar way? Yes, I do. So how many uh, years have you been attending Jim's Barbecue Bash? This is my first year. Oh, excellent. Mine too. Uh, you're enjoying it so far? It's wonderful. Everybody's wonderful. The food was wonderful. Yeah, I'm having a great time as well. Well, I appreciate you taking a few minutes to talk to me, Lisa, and to the audience of Cult Free Radio. Um, Good luck and enjoy the rest of your freedom. And thank you for having me. Thanks. That was Lisa. Thank you so much, Lisa, for uh, sharing some of your time with me and taking some time out from uh, the barbecue. Again, as with during Ruben's discussion, you could hear uh, a lot of fun going on in the background. Uh, A happy group of uh, former cult members sharing a good time. So it was really uh, a really, really nice barbecue, a really good time to talk to everybody. And so thank you again so much, Lisa. Now, I uh, would like to, at this point, talk about Mad Sweeney. (laughs) I... um, Realized while I was putting all this together that, um, you know, we're getting the stories from uh, Ruben and Lisa and our guests that are coming up later, uh, which would be Terry and Jim, and all the previous guests that we've had, uh, Tim and Lance and uh, Jane and, and, you know, I don't want to try to name everybody because I'll miss somebody, but uh, all of our guests have given their experiences and stories, but... Uh, I haven't really given my uh, complete story on the air of Cult Free Radio. Before I started, uh, I did kind of put together a little Who is Mad Sweeney, which was a brief introduction, and uh, I've uh, clipped some of that that I'd like to play this evening for the audience. And then uh, when that's finished, I'd like to continue with that and uh, speak live a little bit about where I'm coming from and where I'm at at this point. So uh, I guess we might consider this next portion a self-interview with Mad Sweeney. For over 40 years, I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and for approximately three years, a little bit more perhaps now, 
I've been sort of working my way free from that organization. Uh, I feel like I'm completely out, but uh, I do have some family members that are still in the Jehovah's Witnesses. And so uh, I still have some sort of connection to that religious organization. Um, so why did I want to do Cult Free Radio on Ustream? Well, I've been very active over the last few years, participating in online internet message boards, uh, somewhat on Facebook. And there's so many good conversations through that medium that are happening via text and that are preserved, archived for basically all time or for as long as the internet lasts. But I felt like it might be a good opportunity for some of us who are on these message boards or who have friended one another through Facebook to hear each other speak in a sort of live, uh, extemporaneous format where we can talk about some of the same things that we talk about on the message board, but uh, rather than wait for a reply hours or days later, we uh, can get a nice good thread, so to speak, discussed in a matter of an hour or two. So I've also noticed that nobody else is really doing this yet, and I thought it was something that kind of needs to be done. There needs to be some sort of way for former members of high-control religious groups, uh, current members who are sort of questioning and, and looking for something, uh, information of this sort, and potential recruits so that they can learn what these high-control religious groups, what uh, a lot of people call cults, are all about, how they operate, and uh, what they do to and for their recruits and members. So something live, as opposed to on a message board or on Facebook, I thought would be helpful, educational, uh, encouraging to those of us who are in a similar situation. And uh, I thought it might be fun, and so far, so good. I'm, uh, I've only been doing this a few minutes, actually, but I'm having a pretty good time. But why me? Why Mad Sweeney? What makes me qualified to do this show? Well, uh, because I live in a free society, and I have broken free from a high-control cult or organization... I can. I have a computer with broadband connection. I have a microphone. I actually have a camera, too, but uh, you don't want to look at me for two hours, uh, believe me. And so I can speak to this topic. I also have some personal experience as a member for over four decades being raised in the Jehovah's Witness organization. Also, I've worked really hard myself the last few years educating myself. I've taken classes at the university on psychology, sociology. I read as much as I can, surfing the Internet and books, viewed videos online, uh, and I can recommend some too. Um, on YouTube, you might want to Google or, or search for Milgram's, M-I-L-G-R-A-M-S, Obedience to Authority Experiment. Or you might want to look at Ash's Conformity Experience, and Ash is spelled A-S-H-E. Or Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiments. Or you might want to go on, uh, look for TED Talks. Uh, Catherine Schultz recently gave a talk on being wrong. That's uh, the title. And so... There's lots of YouTube out there that can uh, educate you on psychology, group dynamics, uh, principles of obedience to authority, especially that can apply to religious cults. Uh, conformity is used a lot by religious cults. And a reluctance to be wrong. So those videos that I mentioned might be good. Uh, I'll try to document them in text somewhere. If not on Ustream, then I'll definitely do it on Facebook, because I know you can't be sitting there writing down, dictating everything I'm saying, and some of these names you may not have, have gotten the same spelling. 
Uh, but anyway, that's those are some videos that uh, I really liked and enjoyed and I thought were educational that I saw online. Also, books such as uh, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. That uh, book is a psychology book written more focused on business, sales, how people uh, persuade one another as far as getting clients. Uh, the principles of psychology in that book are no different for religious organizations than they are for somebody who's trying to sell you a vacuum, um, sell you a Bible, sell you their organization. It's all the same deal. Uh, another great book on cognitive dissonance, justification, uh, confirmation bias, things such as that. It's called Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me. Uh, another great book that helps uh, members and former cult members to see how uh, these high control organizations operate and operate in the same way uh, is Combating Cult Mind Control by Steve Hassan. Uh, I've also read Age of Reason, Thomas Paine, uh, Crisis of Conscience by Raymond Franz, Captives of a Concept by Don Cameron, In Search of Christian Freedom, uh, also by Raymond Franz, and uh, I'm working on right now uh, reading Teaching Your Child How to Think, which is about educating our kids uh, and ourselves on critical thinking as opposed to just uh, buying everything that's sold to us. So from all that sort of reading and uh, taking classes over the last couple years and watching YouTubes and all that kind of thing, I feel like I've learned more about the psychology that's used by these high control organizations, either religious or business, they're all similar. And looking back at my own personal experience as a member, I find that they violate what I consider some of the most basic of psychological human rights. And those are the right to complete and truthful information the right to think and analyze that information autonomously, without pressure. The right to feel whatever emotions one feels without repercussions or threats, without guilt or fear. And the right to choose one's own behaviors based upon thoughtful analysis of that complete and truthful information. In a way that can produce for ourselves real positive feelings of joy, love, friendship. And these are things that high control religious groups take away from people or manipulate so that people believe that they have, but they actually don't. And so this is what I'd like to talk about on our first show, uh, which is, again, it's coming up Saturday night, April 30th, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And I hope everybody will uh, enjoy it. I hope enough people will participate so that... Uh, you don't have to listen to my voice for a couple hours straight. We can have a conversation as opposed to a monologue. Uh, I think we're going to really uh, have a good time. I know it can be sort of a drag sometimes to talk about uh, the problems that we've been through, the things we've experienced in the past. But uh, I think also seeing that we're not unique in one particular organization, the Children's Witnesses are not unique, uh, and that our own personal situation is not unique. Each of us have gone through many similar things. And then in another way, we are all unique in a, way, in a way. So we can share both our similarities, our differences, and we'll come out of this weekend hopefully much stronger for it, able to face the future, because freeing ourselves from these uh, sorts of organizations, it really um, it sets us up for a better future, a future that we can enjoy real relationships that we know are genuine based on information that we know we've seen and learned all sides of the issue and that we've been allowed to think and feel the way that we want to think and feel about this information that we receive and that we can choose how we're going to live our lives from today on and every day. Well, that was a clip from the introduction I did back in April. And one thing I noticed when I listened to it again was that it was uh, an introduction to the Mad Sweeney of cult-free radio, but it kind of...
glossed over a lot of uh, who Mad Sweeney the person is. I gave a little bit of my background as a witness, but um, I feel like I still have... I get questions and, and there's more to say. And so, for instance, people ask, why Mad Sweeney, if that's not your real name? Where did that come from? Well, I've been participating in Internet message boards for quite a long time, actually since before there were Internet message boards, back when there were uh, text-based Usenet news groups. Um, there was a, a thing called Roundtable Discussions on uh, Genie, which was a General Electric sort of Internet service. And... As Internet usage grew and became popular in the mid to late 90s, security became an issue for people participating online. And like most people online at the time, we figured out that uh, it's probably not a good idea to use your own name. And so being a fan of science fiction and fantasy, as I mentioned in the social stream, I was a Jehovah's Witness. I didn't read nonfiction. I read basically all fiction, as uh, including The Watchtower and The Awake magazine. So uh, as a fan of science fiction and fantasy, I tended to pick character names from some of my favorite books, shows, and movies. And uh, this was before The Watchtower really came out strongly against online associations. They were always about five to ten years behind the curve of things, and sometimes even longer. But... Um, there were a lot of witnesses going online at the time, uh, some to talk religion and defend their faith, and uh, but I was just more interested in sports and science fiction groups, and so I rarely got into religious discussions at the time. And so at that time, I would go by different characters, uh, the Dread Pirate Roberts or the Marquis de Carabas or different characters from books I've read. And Mad Sweeney... Uh, in addition to be a legendary Irish king who went crazy, he's also a character from the Neil Gaiman novel American Gods, which, by the way, may become an HBO miniseries uh, within the next year or two. And this character is a tall, skinny, leprechaun-type figure who ends up drinking himself to death because nobody believes in him anymore. And... Basically, he's the opposite of the real me, who's a short, chubby, American-type figure who doesn't drink at all anymore because I've learned to believe in myself. And so I always go with the science fiction or fantasy-type character. And in a lot of places online, I am the Dread Pirate Roberts. But for the sake of keeping my cult-free religious life separate from the rest of my life, especially online and off... You won't see Mad Sweeney on a NFL site or a NCAA hockey discussion board or on any of the science fiction boards. I'm still there, but under those other names. And so for religious and cult-free discussions, in addition to cult-free radio, I participate a lot, as most of you know, on jehovahswitness.net. Uh, I'm increasingly participating in some Facebook groups like the one Ruben mentioned, uh, X Jehovah's Witness Recovery 3, also The End is Nigh, but this time we really mean it. Uh, also, I've contributed to www.xjw.com. There's a dash in there, x-jw.com. And um, so I'm pretty busy online with, with that kind of stuff. There's also a group for Cult Free Radio on Facebook as well. Now, when I was just a toddler, as I mentioned I, in the recorded part, I was two years old when uh, my mom started studying, or at least became a return visit. And my sister was already a witness at the time and was trying to take me to meetings and trying to get mom to go as well. And so before long... Mom was studying the truth book, and she was baptized at the district convention in 1975. So I was basically raised a Jehovah's Witness. And like most Jehovah's Witnesses who grew up in the organization, I got married young, but I was very, very lucky. Uh, my wife is somebody I am happy to spend the rest of my life with, 
And so many of my witness friends who I grew up with are either already divorced or they are stuck in marriages they're unhappy with because they just don't have one of the excuses or reasons that the Watchtower allows for divorce. Um, there are a few happily married witness friends that I've grown up with as well, but there are a lot who are not. So I'm very thankful for my wife and the marriage I have. Now, while I was a witness, I progressed pr pretty slowly compared to a lot of brothers, and I think it was because of a couple things. And one of them was that I was way too honest for my own good. You know, I would never go around saying things that I didn't mean, like a lot of guys did. Like, I really wish I could pioneer and go to Bethel. I've been praying about it. I wouldn't say those things just to make myself look more spiritual than the people around me. And I never really had interest in either of those things that would have put me on the fast track for becoming an elder. Now, I've known kids who, in their mid-twenties, were appointed as elders because of their pioneering and spending a few years in Bethel service. But I took a slow, steady pace, knowing that that kid who was appointed in his twenties would probably be burned out and stepping down by the time I even got appointed. So eventually, in my late thirties, I became a ministerial servant. And I quickly started getting assignments like public talks and the watchtower conductor for the small foreign language group my family was in. And I put in a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of gas money traveling all over the place to give talks and trying to convince others there to come to our little neck of the woods to give talks too. You know, it was kind of fun for me. I enjoyed that a lot more than I enjoyed going out in field service. But if I had stayed, I was on track for probably becoming an elder at some point since I had been conducting the Watchtower and giving public talks and those sorts of things. But then something happened. Something, just as I was getting my feet under me as a ministerial servant, something happened to open my mind that the people running the organization were basically delusional. Uh, as somebody raised as a Jehovah's Witness, I knew there were times when guys who were relative dopes from the perspective of the real world would work the system and manage to get appointed as elders. But I felt like most Jehovah's Witnesses feel that they were the exception rather than the rule and that Jehovah would work it out in his own due time. What I didn't know was that delusional thoughts and ideas originated with the organization itself. And here's here's how I found out. I always had a really good sort of personal relationship with the men on the body of elders, basically because they were mostly my peers. Some were a little bit older, some were somewhat younger. We were all men of equal status, or so I thought. Now, there came a point where there was an internal decision that the body of elders made that was going to be detrimental to the foreign language group I was working with. And it was going to also create a ton of extra work for me personally. And so, you know, being with the guys, my friends, I thought, I complained out loud verbally about it, thinking, you know, my gripe has merit, and knowing that most of the elders on the body didn't really have a clue about the impact that their particular decision was going to have. So I complained out loud. I didn't think too much of it. And uh, I thought, well, that was that. Well, a couple of weeks later, the presiding overseer, which they were still called at the time, asked me to meet with him and another elder to discuss some of the concerns he heard I was having. Well, great. I thought, all right, somebody's actually listening to me and, and going to do something about this. Well, that little bit of optimism was short-lived because the meeting with the elders ended up consisting of counsel on pride, counsel on questioning, counsel on obedience, and it culminated with the presiding overseer applying Revelation chapter 1 verse 20, which is the scripture where Christ is said to hold the stars in his right hand. They applied that to themselves as those stars. And he said that according to Watchtower Doctrine, and I checked later to make sure that the elders weren't making it up, questioning a decision by a body of elders is equal to challenging the authority of Jesus Christ himself. Well, 
there is no arguing with that kind of lunacy. I knew these guys. They had no special insight, and especially no specific insight into this foreign language stuff. They weren't representing Jesus in this prideful viewpoint they had. They were just using that as an excuse so they wouldn't have to rethink their decision and perhaps admit that they were wrong and that a lowly ministerial servant was correct. So from that day on, I didn't take anything said by any of the organization leadership at face value anymore. Because really, how can you tell a human being not to think, not to ask questions, and then expect him to remain compliant and obedient and still be content at the same time. I mean, it obviously works on millions of people, but this specific thing was what kind of broke the spell over me so that I no longer felt that it would be wrong to research and explore outside of the organization literature. Because at that point, I knew that the leadership was a fraud hiding behind a facade of authority. And so the rest is history, as they say. It took several years. Uh, I continued to remain a ministerial servant several years before I stepped down from that. I kept researching on the Internet uh, in secret, in private, before I was really finally convinced that there was nothing in the Watchtower organization worth continuing to put faith in. And one of the final straws that really turned me off was the February 15. 2009 Watchtower article called They Keep Following the Lamb. And that article had actual subheadings called Jehovah Trusts the Slave and The Slave is Trusted by Jesus. And the point of the whole article was that you rank and file Jehovah's Witnesses better trust the slave too. It was, I was still conducting the Watchtower at that time and it was incredibly painful <laughs> to conduct knowing that the entire thing was a lie. But even so, it took another whole year or more to finally get to fade out of the organization for good because, basically, I wasn't going to leave without my wife and daughter, without my family. And the story of, of how we managed to get together and get on the same page is kind of a long one that I'll bring out at another time because we do want to get to the other, the other great interviews we have tonight. Um, we know that it's not easy to get out of the watchtower, even alone, but to get out with your whole family, it's, it's a challenge. It's difficult. Now, as I said in the earlier segment that was recorded back in April, I really decided that I wanted to do a talk radio show that was fairly that was from a secular perspective because a lot of the discussion groups, a lot of the websites, a lot of the, uh, the call-in shows and things are from a religious perspective, from a Christian perspective. And I feel like there needed to be something from a secular perspective because when your criticism of the Watchtower is based on the view that they're doctrinally wrong, for example, that they're wrong about the divinity of Christ or about the rejection of the cross, you're missing what I think is the real issue, which are the Watchtower's violation of those four fundamental human rights. The right to complete and truthful information, the right to think and analyze that information autonomously, the right to feel whatever emotions one feels without the fear of repercussions, and the right to choose one's own behavior based upon thoughtful analysis of that complete and truthful information in a way that produces real positive feelings of friendship and joy and unconditional love. So the Watchtower's biggest crime isn't that they don't believe in the Trinity or some other such religious doctrine. It's the way they violate those four basic human rights consistently and persistently as a mechanism to mentally and to an extent physically enslave members of the Jehovah's Witness religion. And this topic really isn't being talked about anywhere else that I could find, and I think it's important to have an avenue to discuss it. So I decided sometime in the middle of April this year to start Cult Free Radio Show, and I actually presented the first show on April 30th. It's interesting, when I was a witness, I would think and plan and think and plan and not actually do anything unless and until I felt it was ready and perfect. And that's a real stressful way to go through life. And 
for the time that I've been cult-free, I've been working on living just the opposite. There's a thing in Eastern philosophy uh, called Wu Wei, which is kind of a more intuitive and relaxed way of approaching life. I, I think a lot of people in Western society hear about it and they feel like, well, that's just being lazy, it, but it's not that at all. You know, going with the flow, uh, accepting the things that you can't change, understanding the things you can, and following a, your intuition a little bit more is really working out for me, I think. And even though I still plan each show, I don't stress over how it's going to come out, how I'm going to do things. So I feel like the show is, is going well. And I have to admit, part of it is a catharsis for myself. And even if nobody ever listened, I'd still be stronger and healthier for having done it. And on the other hand, though, I really, really hope that it does help others. I hope that as Cult Free Radio progressive progresses on, it won't just be a channel for me to talk and voice my own thoughts and and that's it. I hope it becomes a means of interaction and support and education for others. When a person escapes from a high-control religious group, they remain vulnerable for a period of time. And some people of faith could take advantage of that situation and offer a quick and easy substitute for the Watchtower Society that comes in the form of their own church. But however well-meaning that recruitment might be, it doesn't allow the person to explore and experience what real freedom is. It doesn't allow them the time they need to heal or provide them the tools they need to make their own way free in the world, free from oppressive religious influence. So I hope Cult Free Radio can provide an enlightening avenue for self-understanding and a supportive network for embracing freedom. Now, I don't expect to, of course, bring down the Watchtower Society. It's a multi-billion dollar international corporation with dozens of branches all over the world, and anyone who thinks he can bring down that organization is fooling himself and misleading other people. I really honestly care far less about the corporation than I do about people. Fact is, people are leaving Jehovah's Witnesses every day, and we can also see from the Watchtower's yearbook reports that the growth in the religion is pretty stagnant in lands with a high standard of education. So the purpose, I think, of Cult Free Radio is twofold. Primarily, it's here to educate and support former witnesses and current witnesses who might be considering leaving. And secondarily, if we can educate potential recruits about the tactics that high-control religions have, like Jehovah's Witnesses, and thereby prevent them from joining, we've accomplished even more. So I don't expect the Watchtower Society to go bankrupt or disappear in our lifetimes, but if the religion stops growing or if its growth rate falls below even the birth rate at some point over the next few decades, I think we could consider that a victory. But more importantly, if Cult Free Radio helps somebody who's left the organization through their healing process, if it convinces somebody to embrace freedom of thought and independence of action, their own autonomy, or if it teaches someone who may have been recruited the things that they need to know to save them from joining, then Cult Free Radio has done its job. So I try not to use the phrase, I believe in, anymore, because there are things that I know or am relatively certain about because of the abundance of evidence and the high degree of likelihood that they're real. For instance, I'm pretty sure I'm saying these words right now and that they're being recorded and that other real people somewhere out there are hearing them. But there are things in the universe with far less evidence and a far lower degree or sometimes even unknown degree of likelihood that many people choose to believe in despite the lack of tangible support. And sometimes those beliefs could be helpful in organizing people into communities who work together and accomplishing things that individually the members wouldn't have been able to achieve. But most of the time, however, it's my opinion that it's more beneficial to create communities around relative certainties rather than around mere beliefs. 
And something I'm relatively certain about is that there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, that have been victims of the Watchtower cult, Jehovah's Witnesses. And I think we all spent enough time waiting on Jehovah to solve our problems while we did relatively little to solve them for ourselves. So as we all become together more and more cult-free, we can shed the shackles of belief and embrace the freedoms that are the right of all intelligent beings. We can heal our damaged hearts, minds, and bodies and work together to help heal one another. So that is Mad Sweeney's testimony for the evening. And we've got some more experiences and interviews to speak with tonight. And so let's get right back to the recordings. This is Mad Sweeney at Jim Moon's July 4th Independence Day Barbecue Bash. And I'm here with Terry. Hey, Terry. Now, this barbecue bash is in celebration of freedom in two different ways. We're celebrating uh, Independence Day for the United States and independence of our lives from the Watchtower Society. So, Terry, uh, tell me a little bit about your upbringing. Were you born and raised a Jehovah's Witness, or did you convert? I, I was. Um, fourth generation, born and raised. Yeah. Fourth generation, so that's... Great grandparents, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. If not before, you know. Wow. So you were baptized at what age? Oh, man, what, 17? Back in 89. Okay, 17 years old. Now, when you were growing up, uh, Cult Free Radio tries to focus on freedoms and how we can break free from the different methods and techniques of control imposed by cults such as the Watchtower Society and when you were growing up as one of Jehovah's Witnesses or as a Jehovah's Witness kid, were there certain things that you had a natural tendency to be interested in or to to wish you could do that uh, you were deprived of? Hmm. Think about that. You know, I, I, I never um, I, I never felt that I was deprived of the, the whole holiday thing or, or, or birthdays. I think my parents did a pretty good job of making sure that we got the uh, the attention that we would have missed out on. Um, I remember them making a point of having celebrations otherwise, and and I actually feel like that's uh, one of the one of the one of the few benefits I got out of the, the whole experience was that um, I, I don't feel that my my giving or paying attention to someone is tied to a certain date on the calendar. So I, I feel feel pretty good about that. Um, I, I do feel that I, I, I missed out on certain experiences just just on having a basic childhood. I mean, I should have had a BB gun. I should have been able to uh, have have a mohawk. Uh, I, I should have been able to um, go to uh, to camp with with other kids. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think I'd have a much better time relating with other people in general if I had um, had the opportunity to, to associate with different people as a kid. Interesting. So you mentioned camp and and a BB gun. Uh, were there uh, certain types of entertainment that uh, you might have been restricted from? Certain bands, music, or, or films, perhaps? Um, growing up, yeah, my, my parents were pretty strict about R-rated films, mm-hmm. but, um, I mean, when, when I was old enough to make my own decision, I pretty much <laughs> did my own thing anyway. Um, music was kind of strange. Uh, I remember my, my dad looking through my, my music collection as a teen and, and turning his nose up at certain things, but I don't remember anything being banned. So uh, I, th- I think it was pretty cool about those things. Um, but I, I was steered away from... Uh, I don't know. I think it's definitely changed my taste as it is now. I don't have any kind of taste for for, for heavy metal, (laughs) Mm -hmm. anything along those lines. Okay. So, (laughs) (laughs) just a little bit of commentary. All the noise in the background, that's free ex-Show's Witnesses having a good time. So, in in case the listeners are wondering, what's all the laughter and the jingle jangle? Uh, We've got... Probably from age, I don't know, nine up to people approaching 70, perhaps, I don't know. So it's, it's a good diverse crowd here of, of friends getting to know each other. But uh, back to Terry. So you were raised as a Jehovah's Witness. You were baptized at 17. Um, did you participate in any of what they call reaching out in the organization as a younger adult? 
Were you a ministerial servant or an elder? Oh, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I pioneered, and, and my, my uh, parents encouraged me to pioneer by making it clear that I could live at home without rent, and, and they would uh, <laughs> even pay my car insurance as long as I was pioneering. Um, and my, uh, they also made it clear that it was expected <laughs> that I would pioneer. It wasn't just a, uh, a, a flat-out deal. I uh, remember my dad telling me that he, he wanted me to, I mean, if, if we were just in, in the world as is, he would be pushing me to get an education in electronics and, and computing and, and that sort of thing. So he had an aptitude to, 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 uh, for that. But um, instead, I was steered toward, uh, toward that direction. Um, later on in my 20s, I did become a ministerial servant. And uh, I, it, at some points, I felt that I was on the track to, to be an elder. Um, and when, when I turned 19, like... Um, most guys in my area I got an application to go to Bethel, um, filled it out, turned it in. Oh, and actually, I hadn't thought about this for a very long time, but um, I retracted my application because I got engaged. Okay. Yeah. And so you were married at uh, what age? At 20. 20 years old. Okay. And so the marriage canceled the Bethel application, uh, but did you, you continue to pioneer? Yeah. Okay. yeah, we we pioneered the best we could for a couple of years, but um, um, making ends meet as, a, as both pioneering, uh, it just it just didn't happen, didn't work. Now, looking back on that, uh, I guess sort of deal your parents made, you can live at home rent free and get your uh, car insurance paid for as long as you pioneer. Uh, looking back now, knowing what you know, do you see that as a, a little bit of a a control mechanism or a uh, kind of an unwritten or unspoken threat over your head that, well, you almost had very little choice but to pioneer? In a way. I mean, I, I was I was groomed for that and raised for that anyway. Um, so it, it, it's not like it was it was um, it, it was a, a boom lowered on me or, or anything like that. But uh, at times it did it did feel like a threat because they, if, if you quit pioneering, you're going to have to start paying your insurance. So uh, it, it did keep me going. Um, I, I also tried to, to keep as, as sincere as, as I could. I think the, the, and during those years, I was probably uh, my heart was in it the most during those years. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't all that uh, much of a struggle for me to, to keep trying. So um, at the time, you didn't feel coerced? No, I, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, right. at, at times it did feel like a threat if I talked to them about maybe stopping, and then they, then they would come back, well, you better get a better job, <laughs> or something like that. Right. Because, it, yeah, there, there was a, an element of control, but um, from their perspective, uh, they would have just been passing down the control from... Um, from the organization itself, more than just more than it being controlled from my parents. Right, right. And so, the sort of control that's used by the organization, do you feel like that um, it's pretty common that members just kind of do those things because it's what people in the organization do? They're, they're not really aware, like your parents weren't, um, obviously. You sound like you had a loving family and a good relationship with your parents. Uh, they weren't trying to be oppressive or trying to stunt your growth into adulthood or trying to control what sort of person you were going to be, in your opinion. That's that's what I'm getting from you. Yeah, that's about right. Okay. Um, then you were married. You uh, told me earlier off the air that you, you had some kids. You have a family that you were raising. Uh, at some point, you had started to think about, well, what did you start to think about? <laughs> well, well, what happened? Why are you here and not no, there I mean, today? I, I, it's, it is kind of hard to explain because at, the, at that point it was more emotional than, than logical. Uh, I saw the pressure that was being put upon me, and, and much of it really didn't make sense I mean, it didn't jive with what we were being told about it being um, all about love and all about um, uh, not trying to do better than others. It, it wasn't supposed to be about ego, and it wasn't supposed to be about status. And my grandmother would say, hey, your, your cousin just made elder. And I'm like, you know, that, that, that phrase just kept ringing in my mind. He made elder. What is that? I mean, it's, it's not like he's in the Army and he just made colonel. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's 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 not how it's supposed to be. 
and that, that made it very difficult for me to even want to reach out um, because I, I didn't want anybody saying that about me because it just felt completely wrong. Um, so I, as I went out in service with elders and they asked me if I was going to be reaching out and I said, you know, I'd really like to, but then I went home and thought, you know, I really don't want to. I don't want. I don't want to do this. Um, this isn't. This isn't me. And and I, I need to figure out who I am. Um, and being being in that uh, that marriage that um, when it really comes down to it, it should have shouldn't have been a marriage at the, in, at the, in the first place. And again, I can't regret it because I got those uh, the two beautiful boys from it. But um, the, the marriage, which was uh, stifling and, and pretty much um, reinforced the, the idea from the organization of well, you need to meet up and meet your potential, but not your real personal potential, just the box that we want you to fit into. Um, it just caused me to to uh, isolate myself and, until uh, there were there was there were one or two in the, in the what we called the world who um, seemed to understand and gave me a hearing ear and became a confidant. Um, and after that, it, it became disfellowshipped, and uh, it took me some years uh, trying to figure out. I mean, because you, you, as you described, my parents they were uh, they were there was a loving family, and they were, they were a large family. They were they were all in that organization, including all my lifelong friends. So it was a huge draw to me to try to uh, to try to want to go back. So I kind of vacillated between wanting to go back and and trying to go back, or trying to figure out what I was going to do um, until it all it all the logic all came together. Uh, the the key was um, when I uh, really allowed myself to be objective and really see things for what they are, because that's, that seems to be the hardest thing. Uh, when you have all these voices in your head telling you all those things that you, uh, you were um, helped or were made to believe for all those years, being objective is, is, is surprisingly difficult. Once I could do that, uh, the fantasy fell apart, and that's when I felt <laughs> a great combination of freedom and fury. And that's why I'm here. Yeah, I recall the, the sort of conflicting emotions as well, where you're you're relieved to a certain extent but then there's there's still a little bit of uh resentment towards yourself and the people that that were around you that why didn't i see it why didn't you see it why didn't any of us see it <laughs> and tell one another so that that's kind of where where i had to get through that and uh sort of be able to come to terms with um so were there any particular things that you uh, learned about, read about, um, discovered, any particular bit of information that uh, you did not have access to as a witness mm -hmm. that you have discovered while you were um, trying to find yourself during that period? Oh, absolutely. That sort of stood um, out to you. <laughs> one of the first things, and I, I don't, I'm not sure this is what you're looking for, one of the first things I looked into when I when I left uh, the organization itself was um, the Buddhist teachings and, uh, and even Taoism. I'm um, just looking for, uh, I, I think I was just looking for ways to, to relax, quiet my mind and quiet my heart. And what I found was keys to understanding myself, keys to understanding people, Understanding who they are and why they are, uh, I understood why I was doing what I was doing and what I did, what I had done, um, and why people are the way they are. It was just it was a huge difference between the kind of counsel you get from the elders, which is pray about it, read the awake, and, and study more. And and if that doesn't work, wait until the new order, and everything will, will just be fixed then, uh, which is really quite useless. Um, but I found some really useful help that um, helped me to really bring some things together and, and live a better life. Um, but what really helped me uh, on the logical side was studying uh, well, Steve Hassan's book, um, Combating Cult Mind Control. That was the first thing I allowed myself to read. I didn't want to read, uh, read anything that was from an extra Jehovah's Witness first. Um, I wanted to read something from someone but from a, a third point of view. And um, comparing his writings with uh, the Jehovah's Witness uh, methods was very eye-opening. And I also had to decide for myself whether uh, being a cult was a good or bad thing. I mean, I, I, I tried to be objective and ask myself questions such as, well, if they're if they're uh, using cult ta tactics for good, is that such a bad thing? And uh, and I decided, no, it is it is a bad thing. <laughs> it's, and it's destructive, and it's caused a lot of pain and heartache and uh, stunted a lot of lives. 
Well, now that you're free to be yourself, that you've discovered or are on a path to discovery of who you really are and, and who you want to be for the rest of your life, um, do you feel like there are things that you enjoy doing now that you weren't able to do as a witness? And, and what, what about those brings you joy now, and what would have been the repercussions if you tried to enjoy them while you were a witness? Oh, many. And one of my letters to my parents, I... I um, uh, so try to get across to the point that, um, and I mean, w without you know, how, do, how do I put this? W without the belief that there's a, um, a fantastical, happy life about to be handed to me that's just going to fix everything, it makes this life that much more valuable. And it seems like before I was just willing to throw this away for something that wasn't going to happen. So everything's more enjoyable. Um, I've been able to do things that uh, that I've always wanted to that aren't destructive, such as you know, if I if I want to smoke a cigar, I can enjoy that. And I can have a, a balanced point of view with it and, and enjoy something like that without <clears throat> getting involved in addictions. And I can I can enjoy just being with people that I, I uh, before would have judged and I would have considered myself above in some way, even if just based on special knowledge. Uh, now I can just enjoy being with them and understanding that we're all uh, we're all in it together. And... Excellent. So you mentioned Terry that you read Steve Hassan's Combating Cult Mind Control and that it helped you to free your mind regarding the religion. Could you tell us a specific example or two of how you feel that B I T E Bite mind control was used on you while you were a member of Jehovah's Witnesses, and how you feel now that you're free of that control? Well, sure, no doubt. Um, well, starting with B, I remember uh, be behavioral control is is extremely um, prevalent, and uh, and um, it, it goes a long way in in the uh, in control in general because it reminds me of, of the phrase "fake it till you make it." Um, if you're in a situation where where you want to do a certain thing or, or you want a certain result, but you don't, you're not really feeling it. You just keep on uh, acting it out, and eventually you'll get it, and, and you'll get into it. Um, but but in this case, you're actually um, kind of being prodded along to behave a certain way until it feels natural, and then of course that that begets the uh, the, the feeling, uh, so to speak, that that, uh, that supports that behavior. And I think that's that's a real human trait. Um, in order for a, for a human being to basically justify or be comfortable with their behavior, they either have to stop the behavior or feel okay with it. And that was definitely true. From I mean, everything from field service to having to try to witness to kids at school, um, um, giving uh, giving talks, which actually uh, uh, became, became second nature to me uh, eventually. Um, even on even on subjects that I didn't feel all that great about. Um, the behavior of, of uh, giving comments and and uh, giving those talks over and over again um, it, it really instilled instilled that, that belief into me over time and of course the information control I think um, you're very familiar with that uh, since I was only surrounded by people who were who were, who were witnesses and all my family were witnesses and, and they wasn't to associate with uh, with kids from school or neighborhood or or uh, any, anyone else who wasn't a witness or watched movies uh, that were, were disapproved of, the information was tightly controlled. Uh, and right along with that goes the thought control. Um, and wow, the emotion control, that, that's, um, that's something that I've actually only been helped to understand through therapy. <laughs> because uh, I remember my father telling me, well, if, if you don't do this, then it means you don't love Jehovah. Um, and he would even go as far as to say that you, well, it's, it's, you're just showing me that you don't love your mother, which was um, actually emotionally crippling in some ways. Uh, they, it took me some decades to get over and and um, to, to be free of and feel the way I, uh, I need to feel instead of the way I was told to. So, um, yeah, that, that, that B-I-T-E was, was, I think, used rather thoroughly. Yeah, well, thanks, Terry. It really, to me, too, um, I see how it can be almost like a feedback mechanism on each other. The behavior kind of informs the thoughts and feelings because you have to feel okay with what you're doing, like you said. And then when the thoughts and feelings are manipulated via the meetings and the the, uh, the studies and the doctrinal information, then that kind of affects your behavior as well. And, you know, it kind of all bounces back, back and forth uh, 
off of each other, kind of a, a feedback mechanism that builds each other up. And before you know it, you're totally in the grasp of the organization. Well, I remember my therapist saying, you, you mean you were taught that you had the ability to change your mother's emotions? That's a superpower. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, to be able to actually change how someone feels is, is pretty special. So I'm sitting there thinking, so I actually have the superpower of changing the master of the universe's feelings. Uh, so yeah, that's, it's, it's pretty out of proportion, but, um, it was all part of what we were talking. Yeah. I, and I'm glad you mentioned therapy. I think part of being in the organization, you're, you're kind of brought up to have a sort of negative outlook on counseling and professional therapists. And as well, it's just, I think maybe it's a bit of an American thing as well to be, uh, you know, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get over it sort of thing. But therapy really helps. My wife and I both had counseling uh, together and individually since uh, leaving the Watchtower organization, and it, it's really helped. So anybody who's listening who thinks that uh, they don't need it or it wouldn't help or it wouldn't do any good, give it a shot, even if it's just four, five, six sessions. And just to get this stuff uh, out there, you, you'll be surprised at, at what you learn, don't you agree, Terry? Oh, it's true. I mean, just getting a different perspective and being able to, to put things in different terms, it, it makes a huge difference. So, yeah, even if you take advantage of, like you said, five or six sessions, a lot of times your uh, your company's insurance will uh, will handle that for free. Yeah, many insurance plans cover what they call uh, employee assistance program or other sorts of. Um, free sessions that are limited in nature to maybe either four or six meetings with a counselor. And then if you still need a specialist, then that will be referred to the insurance company to cover any further help. But uh, even those few meetings and sessions can really be a big help to people who, who are exiting from the organization. Well, Terry, I appreciate you spending a little time with Cult Free Radio this afternoon. Enjoy your freedom and have a happy Fourth of July. Thank you much. Um, you probably noticed there that about three quarters of the way through, the background noise disappeared. Well, um, that's because there was a question I didn't get just right in the original recorded interview. So I called Terry later on uh, via Skype and recorded that question and Terry's answers, and uh, we kind of dropped that into the recording of the program. So that's why there was a difference in the sound quality there for part of it, and I just wanted to explain that for people who think, hey, that sounded like that got edited. Well, it, it kind of did. Um, so thank you very much, Terry. That is uh, three live interviews down and one to go. I guess four if you count me. And before we proceed to our fourth recorded interview of the night, uh, I'd like to get back to another one of the uh, submitted comments that were in response to the question I put on Facebook and on the message boards about uh, the exit to freedom from the Watchtower Society. And one of the comments read, I admit that I still struggle with depression, loneliness, social awkwardness, and other issues, but there is now the light that I can see at the end of the tunnel. There is hope of a better life out there. I'll freely admit that I had no idea that I was under mind control at the time, especially because I had returned to the Jehovah's Witnesses to be baptized for what I had believed to be my own reasons. A few years later, I left them, again, for my own reasons. It wasn't until about a couple of years after leaving that I realized how bad things really were. I was in a support group meeting one time, one night, and the topic was FOG, fog, namely fear, obligation, and guilt. It was right then and there that it hit me, and it felt like I was whacked over the head with a two by four. The organization does indeed use FOG, fear, obligation, guilt, to control and manipulate its members, just like an evil manipulative parent or spouse. I broke down in tears over it that night. I hadn't been able to cry or shed a tear in about the two years previous since the last time I saw the inside of the local kingdom hall. It was such a release. I'm bound and determined 
now more than ever not to return to the Jehovah's Witnesses. They are as a whole manipulative and destructive. I wish that my family would wake up to that fact. So I appreciate that input as well. We all can see from that how how really powerful emotionally the organization is on its members and even on ex-members after we leave. It's really not anything like leaving uh, other kinds of organizations or clubs. It's not like canceling your phone service for a different company. It's not like even switching from a Baptist church to a Methodist church. It, it really can be very uh, difficult and traumatic. And so I'm really thankful that we all have each other. Uh, we had the group there at Jim Moon's Barbecue. We have each other online on the message boards, on Facebook, and here on Cult Free Radio. So thank you, everybody, for participating and for your input, because it really it helps. If you're anything like me, it helps you as well just to be able to speak, because um, doing this Cult Free Radio every couple of weeks here for the past couple of months have really helped me to work through some things just by being able to talk about them. Now, finally, we have our gracious host of the 4th of July Barbecue Bash, Jim Moon himself. He has a very interesting story, just like everyone else we spoke with this evening. So without further ado, here's Jim. <laughs> when I see something like that, it just reminds me of how old I am. Yeah, look how tiny. When, when I was a kid, the size of a tape recorder and you had to have you know yeah the reel, reel to reel it was the yeah. reel to reel my brother-in-law had the one of those had, it must it must have weighed 70 or 80 pounds mm -hmm. you know just this huge gigantic thing and that was brand new really exciting technology yeah and it had the separate microphone that you had you know held up in your hand then the cassette recorder came out and that was like wow they really shrunk mm -hmm. you know? and now if I don't pay attention, I'll lose it because it's so small. I was telling, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, these little iPods. Um, I used to uh, DJ back in the 70s. Same station that Danny Bonaducci DJs on now. WYSP in Philadelphia. Cool. And uh, I was telling one of the guys where I work, one of, the, one of my patients, who has this little tiny iPod who was had it hooked up to one of our computers and was downloading these like thousands of songs okay and i told him i says when i was your age i said and i was djing at this radio station it took an entire room to fill up what you're filling up on this little tiny thing that's no bigger than a credit card yep it's amazing. Absolutely, absolutely unbelievable. It really is absolutely amazing. Absolutely unbelievable. It's cool. I love you know, the technology. Who, who, who would have ever thought, I'm giving my age away saying all this stuff, <laughs> that I'd be carrying my own telephone around in my pocket. Yeah. You know? Yep. It is. It's crazy. Well, Jim, this is Mad Sweeney with Cult Free Radio at Jim Moon's Independence Day Barbecue Bash for ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, celebrating our independence from the Watchtower Society, and I am with the host, Jim Moon. Jim, thank you for having us here today. Oh, I'm glad you came. Yeah, I am too. I'm having a blast. It's a really good time talking to a lot of people and, and really having some good positive experiences. And, and like you had said uh, before we went on the air, just about being around people that um, have shared experiences, and we can help one another through a lot of these things. So... How many years have you been having this 4th of July thing? This is my fourth year doing this. Fourth year, excellent. Mm -hmm. And this is my first attending, but it's uh, it's not definitely not going to be my last. So yeah, thank yeah. you very much for having us. Um, well, the welcome mat's always out for you. Thank you, appreciate it. So how, how did you get um, motivated to start opening your home every 4th of July? Well, it's the, because of the date. Mm -hmm. uh, I was baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses on the 4th of July in 1975. And it dawned on me one year, this would be a really great date for me 
to hold a celebration of my independence from the witnesses by inviting other ex-witnesses to a barbecue. So four years ago, I put the word out on the Internet, and a whole bunch of people showed up. I had them drive in from New York and Washington, and I've been doing it every year ever since. It's just been great. And it's, it's it's a great way for me to celebrate. Yeah, yeah, excellent. It's a, it's a really cool day to do it uh, because of your baptism date and also just because of what Independence and Independence Day symbolizes for uh, Americans and for all of us on a personal level as former witnesses. I've been talking to uh, a lot of your other guests today about um, some of the things that maybe they had found restrictive as far as information control and manipulation of thoughts and feelings and strict control of behaviors that the Watchtower organization puts on people. And how I've been asking some of your guests how they appreciate now uh, the things that they were going through at that time that maybe they weren't aware of and what sort of freedoms that you're enjoying. So for you, what what are you really looking back on your time as a witness? What sort of, of things maybe you didn't notice or, or you felt like you're being controlled in retrospect? Well, God, that question sucked. I'll no, I, under, I, I, I understood exactly what you were saying. Um, there's a... Uh, movie starring Robin Williams and Robert De Niro called Awakenings and it's based on the life of a uh, Dr. Oliver Sacks in the movie he's called by some other name but he took all of these people out of comas that had been you know they, they, they'd been stationary living in these comas for years and through medication was able to bring these people back out of their comas to consciousness and there's one particular scene in that movie where one of the orderlies comes up to one of the one of the reawakened patients and you know slaps him on the shoulder and has a big smile and he says so he says how are you feeling today expecting he's going to get this wow this is really wonderful but the guy said he says well he says my parents are dead my wife is in an institution my children have disappeared out west somewhere. How do I feel? I feel old and I feel swindled. And the first time I heard that line in that movie, I burst into tears. I'm not a, I'm not a crier. And I couldn't stop crying. And I couldn't figure out why. And then it dawned on me. That's what the witnesses did. Hmm. They took away years of my life, my formative years. You know, I was a witness from the age of 17 to 23. Those were very important years of my life that I could have been living as a quote-unquote normal human being instead of going around knocking on people's doors believing that the end of the world was coming because I got baptized in 75 and I thought that I was being handed a sacred trust to go and find other people whose lives I could save and put my own life on hold. Well, I put my own life on hold until 1980. Okay, and then I suddenly realized I'm a sucker. I've been duped. Hmm. You know, they uh, they weren't telling me the truth. You know, the truth is a lie. Yeah, it's really interesting to me the way the language is manipulated because it really is a skill that the organization wields that I'm not really sure they even understand the psychological power. I mean, I think they understand that it, the results it gets, but it really is a, a violation, mm -hmm. I feel, of mm -hmm. people's rights to free and complete information. You don't get that as a witness. You right. get their side of the story and no other side. Right. And it's, it's, like, it's like in the Watchtower study. You've got a paragraph that is read. Then there's a question at the bottom of the page, and there's only one correct answer that can be given, and that's the information that appears in that paragraph. That's indoctrination. Mm -hmm. You know, it's here's another example. I was sitting at the table talking with a bunch of the people here at the picnic earlier today, and I just happened to, off the cuff, 
say 1 Corinthians 15.33, and everybody at the table verbatim said, bad, bad association, spoil useful, useful habits. See? Yep. See? And we all said it in unison, and then we looked at one another like, oh, my God, it's still in us. Mm -hmm. You know, and some of us have been out for years. I've been out for 31 years. It's still in us. Yeah. You know, you can't shake it. It's, it's, they hammer it into your brain. Yeah. Yeah. It, you can move on, but it's, like you say, it's still in there. Absolutely. Yeah. And the way they they load the words, the language, I really appreciated one of the words you used in a previous answer when you talked about what they would call worldly people, you called normal people. Mm -hmm. And that's my new phrase for them, too. All my life, I called people who, there were Jehovah's Witnesses and there were worldly people. Mm -hmm. Now, there are normal people. And there are Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> so it, that helps to, to change the language. Do you feel like that helps to change your mind as well? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, I like my definition of worldly now. Worldly back when I was a witness was an insult. Worldly now means cultured, well-traveled, well-read, you know, uh, a person of the world, a person who enjoys life, who enjoys doing cultured things you know things you know not just sitting back and you know lounging about on the tv and you know on the couch watching tv and you know may you know wasting your life away people who you know they 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 travel they associate with other people they take cruises they fly to places they drive to places they go antiquing i mean there's all sorts of things mm -hmm. you know that as witnesses you would never do even if you took a vacation as a witness, the first thing you did was you looked for the kingdom hall so you could find out when and where you could go out in field service. Yes. What the hell kind of vacation is that? Excuse my French. Yeah. <laughs> I understand <laughs> completely. Or even lots of times, just because of uh, money and finances, your family's vacation for people who are raised in the organization is bent around the convention itself mm -hmm. so you may take an extra day before or an extra day after maybe right and that's your vacation right you know you might say dad mom uh what's our vacation this year oh we're going to the convention mm -hmm. great yeah thanks mm -hmm. nice thanks dad so you know i was at the 1978 <laughs> international assembly in montreal i was too were you i got my book of bible so, stories so did there. you hear <laughs> did you hear freddie franz give that really crazy talk about you shouldn't listen to classical music because classical musicians are homosexuals and listening to the music will turn you gay. I couldn't believe he actually, we were, I mean, we were all applauding, but we were all looking at one another like, did he just say that? I was 10 years old. The only thing I remember about that convention is uh, tenting at uh -huh. the tent city. Uh -huh. And um, we went out in service on, I guess, Thursday afternoon or Friday at that convention, I believe. And nobody spoke English, so I don't know what we were going out in service for anyway. And... Yeah, you were in Quebec. You were, they were yeah, French. everybody spoke yeah. French. Yeah. And we got the book of Bible stories. And uh -huh. That was exciting for me as a 10-year-old. So that, that's all I remember about Montreal. But that, that was a fun experience for a kid, I guess, as far as conventions go. We got to camp, at least. Um, but you had mentioned the formative years when you became a witness at 17. Yes. So at that point... Before you became a witness, did you have aspirations for any sort of higher education, college, or anything like that? And after you became a witness, did you forego those? I had considered the ministry because my father was a Presbyterian minister. And I've always been fascinated by um, not so much religion itself as religious history. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I had toyed with the idea of you know following my father's footsteps. My father had a uh, divinity degree from Princeton Seminary. And, uh, you know, I was fascinated with the fact that he could speak Greek and Hebrew, and I thought, wow, this is, you know, this is really cool. You know, I admired my father a great deal. And, um, you know, my, my life could have taken so many different directions. Um, you know, whether it was higher education, which there, there was, there was a, a, a kink in that, too. Uh, the school system that I went to wanted to direct me in a direction that I chose not to go into and I decided that I was going to follow my own path so through a series of events I ended up leaving this area of Pennsylvania where I'm originally from moving down to Atlanta 
leaving Atlanta and ending up living for a number of years in the Virgin Islands. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was disfellowshipped in the Virgin Islands. That's a very interesting story. Wow, that is interesting. We'll have to talk about that sometime. Yeah. <laughs> the Virgin Islands. Yeah, I was, I, I was disfellowshipped. Basically, I was being uh, used as a pawn in a power struggle between three congregations. And uh, it's quite a story. Interesting. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. So now, you're free. You put this uh, bash on every 4th of July for yep. Independence Day. Yep. What sort of things do you do with your life that you enjoy now that uh, you couldn't do when you were a witness? Oh, well, I'm not afraid of Smurfs. Good. Uh, <laughs> I'm not either. I, I'm not really you know, interested in seeing the movie, but I'm not afraid I, of them. Really, really. <laughs> but, I, but the reason I said that is I... I I, uh, gee, how do I put this? Not being a witness allows me to use the sense of humor that I was given by my creator because the witnesses are so serious all the time. Mm -hmm. And I felt really stifled that way as a witness. And, if, you know, if you follow me on Facebook... You know, you know that I put some pretty absurd stuff on uh -huh. my Facebook page. Sure. And that just, you know, that kind of stuff, just simple stuff like that. Um, I love to travel. Um, even if it's just, you know, a, a car trip for a day or two. Last fall we went to uh, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, and, you know, toured, uh, you know, the old battlefields. I'm a Civil War um, buff. And, oh, awesome. Yeah. Don't live that far from Gettysburg. Right, right. You know. And with the uh, 150th anniversary of the Civil War, you know, in progress now, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of Civil War stuff going on. Yeah. Well, you know, as a witness, this would be considered, you know, oh, he's getting into that patriotic stuff. And, you know, that's something that we really better look at. And yeah. You, you feel like you're under scrutiny. You feel, you feel like you're under the microscope all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that anymore. I'm free to come and go as I please. Yeah. Yeah. And your time is your own as well when you're free from the witnesses. Because even if you're involved in a hobby that's uh, innocuous or, or even that they don't consider a sin, if you spend too much time at it even, yeah. they, they get on you. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're taking time away from what they want you to be doing with mm -hmm. your time. Mm -hmm. So you really, once you get out, you realize how much of your life you didn't have. Whereas I think a lot of times when you're in, you don't realize, you know, you read the Watchtower article that praises you for being a slave and you're a happy slave, but you don't yeah. feel like a yeah. slave until you're free. Yeah. And then you, you know, go, oh my God, I really was a slave. Here, here's, here, here's something interesting. You know, I've been out for a long time. And when I was a witness, you used to hear this phrase, and I guess they still use it, Jehovah's happy people. And back then, everybody walked around with this pasted-on smile on their face. They, they, they all looked like clones of mm -hmm. one another. I've seen witnesses walking out of convention halls, and they don't have that smile on their face anymore. They look very, very uh, weather-worn. I guess yes. would be the best way to put it. Yeah. You know, they're they're not Jehovah's happy people anymore. They're they're Jehovah's people who are just hanging on. Yeah. You know, and you can, you can see it in their faces. Yeah, you really can. You can only be taken and oppressed for so long mm -hmm. before. You know, I sometimes wonder if it's not a little bit of unconscious, subconscious rebellion to to just somehow not perfectly toe that line that the Watchtower wants you to. For the ones that are in, you know, you see them not quite as zealous as they they were 20 or 30 years ago and i wonder if maybe people somewhere in their mind they know something's not right the uh witnesses that i see on the internet especially on facebook and some of the other pages that i visit uh if it weren't for the fact that they said they were jehovah's witnesses they wouldn't be recognizable as witnesses mm -hmm. uh and that tells me something right there uh they're leading double lives yeah. uh, a lot of them just you know go are they're, they're going through the motions they're staying a lot of people that i know who won't leave the organization 
are staying in the organization for the express purpose of being able to remain in touch with their families. Yeah. That's sad. Yeah. That's really sad. That's blackmail. Absolutely. You know, yeah. these people are being blackmailed to remain in a religion which they know is not true. Yeah. You know, because otherwise they're not going to be able to speak to their mother, their father, their brothers, their sisters, their aunts, their uncles, their cousins. You know, if a family member dies, they won't be invited to the funeral. They may not even know that they died. Yeah. Because you know? nobody's calling to talk to them. Exactly. Right. You know, and they know that it's not the truth, but they're going through the motions because they don't want to have that that cutoff. Yeah. You know, they, they don't want that ostracism. You yeah. Know? Now, in my case, it was easy for me to leave because I'm the only person in my family that ever was a witness. And my family welcomed me back with open arms when I was disfellowship. They thought this was the greatest thing since sliced turkey. Excellent. You know, but, you know, because my, my parents were both very opposed to my being a witness. Uh, my grandmother kind of made a joke out of it. Uh, she used to, I, she lived in South Jersey when she was alive. And uh, I introduced an elderly sister to, from the congregation that served her area and had her start a Bible study with my grandmother. Well, my grandmother was really slick. And this Bible study very quickly degenerated into a card game. <laughs> and after a while, the sister would come at the end of her witnessing every Saturday on the pretense of a quote-unquote Bible study with my grandmother and spend three hours playing cards with her and count the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Your grandmother sounds great. Oh, she was. She was. I miss her terribly. That's awesome. She was. She was wonderful. Lived to ninety-four years old. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's great. Well, it's good that you were able to to get out in a period of time where you could reconnect with your family, and um, and to redevelop that relationship yeah. and try to catch up those years that that you missed, because it really is sad. A lot of families are divided. Um, there are some families that, like you mentioned, the whole family's in, so nobody can leave because right. they'd end up leaving the whole family. And then there are families that only half converted, and now you've got branches that, you know, half the family's not witnesses and half the family mm -hmm. is, and, mm -hmm. and they kind of each do their own thing like two separate families because that's basically what, what they, they are. are. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. It's sad. So, freedom. Compare your feelings uh, of joy or happiness or contentedness. Did you did you ever have any positive feelings while you were in, or, or was there always something nagging at the back of your mind once 1975 passed? I, I think I was a good witness up until about uh, 77. Mm -hmm. uh, I hung on to that hope that Armageddon was coming it was just late yeah you, you know, bought the explanation i bought the explanations and i'll tell you what changed me i started a bible study with a man who was a long-term resident at a local mental institution he had met me doing street work and he took the magazines and i got to talking with him. very nice man and i uh I asked him, would you be interested in a home Bible study? He says, well, I don't live in a home. I live at Wernersville State Hospital, long-term ward. I'm like, that's fine. So I took another brother with me from the congregation. We started a Bible study with this man. Well, after a while, we had about a half a dozen different mental patients sitting in on this Bible study. Well, they were, you know, not of the intellect of normal people, so we used that you know, the, 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 the children's book mm -hmm. as the Bible study. And uh, it worked. You know, we started bringing them. We started getting day passes for them and bringing them two by two to the kingdom hall. Well, after maybe about five or six weeks of this, the elders came up to me after the Sunday services and asked me, why are you bringing these people to the kingdom hall? And I said, of all the people that are out there who need salvation, don't these people need it most? And the elders said, perhaps, but they can't understand our doctrine. I said, does that mean that they're going to be condemned to die at Armageddon? And the elders said, yes. Wow. And that's what changed my mind. That's when I started going downhill. That's when 
I began losing my faith. I'm finding that for a lot of people, it's a specific experience with something that an elder or elders say or do mm -hmm. that flips a switch in the mind mm -hmm. that, I mean, it doesn't make you suddenly leave the religion, but it opens your mind up to thinking, hmm, something's not quite right. I need to check this out. Right. And so... Um, well, hopefully the elders will keep it up and do it with more and more people so that uh, more and more people can be freed in their mind to think for themselves because certainly the witnesses aren't really allowed to for just, if not for any other reason, for the basic fact that they don't have the whole story. They don't have complete information. Well, I, I just found that response very elitist. You know, yeah, absolutely. You know, how, how dare they speak for Jehovah because isn't, doesn't it say in the Bible that Jehovah knows the heart? Absolutely, you know? yeah. So here are these people who are taking it upon themselves, saying, well, they're going to die because they don't understand the doctrine, but, you know, they can't look into the heart, so, you know, how dare they? Yeah. How dare they? I saw these same elders threaten an elderly sister in our congregation. They, they threatened to take away her anointed status because she was bringing literature to the Kingdom Hall that was written by Charles Taze Russell, and they said that that was apostate literature. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the man who founded the religion. Yeah. That's amazing. But they said because it was now being used by the evil slave, it was considered apostate, and if this elderly sister didn't stop, and she had the original, she knew Charles Taze Russell. Mm -hmm. She was a really, really old lady. Yeah. And they told her if she didn't stop bringing these magazines, that they were going to take away her anointed status. How can they do that? That's crazy. Where does it say in the elders' manual, <laughs> much less anywhere in Watchtower literature, much less anywhere in the Bible, Nowhere. that you can take somebody's anointed <laughs> status away? Wow. They just they just take this, we control the Holy Spirit, it doesn't control us attitude, apparently. Well, well let, me, <laughs> let me tell you the story real quickly about what happened with me and why I ultimately got myself this fellowship. That I did it deliberately. Sure. I went to see the Rocky Horror Picture Show in the theater, okay? And while I was standing in line to go into the theater, a reporter from the local newspaper was walking down the line interviewing people, why are you here? Well, the movie was fun. You threw rice, you, you know, shot water pistols, you... you it was know, very interactive you know, with the audience. Was, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a participatory movie, and it was really a lot of fun. So I went to see the movie, the reporter asked me my name. He asked me, why am I going to see the movie? And I said, because it's a lot of fun. Well, that Sunday, the article appeared in the local newspaper. And one of the elders' wives saw my name as having been at the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And the, then the article went on to explain that the Rocky Horror Picture Show had transvestism and homosexuality. And I was swarmed by the elders the moment that I walked into the Kingdom Hall. And they told me that I had, uh, what was the word that they used, besmirched the good name of the congregation by having, and it said nowhere in the article that I was a Jehovah's Witness. Right. And I never used my name when I was out in field service, so how is anybody going to know? I, uh, right, but exactly. They were so panicked by this that they actually announced between the watchtower, between the public talk and the watchtower study on a Sunday, which they never do, mm -mm. that I was being given public reproof. Wow. Yeah. They didn't mess around. They didn't mess around because they, they were so panicked about mm -hmm. the fact that I had my name associated with a newspaper article about transvestism and homosexuality. But and, how ignorant, because the know, movie's a farce. Of course it's, it is. It's not, it's, it's not a serious It's shown treatise. on television exactly, now. Exactly, right. You know? Anybody can watch it. Uh -huh. So anyway, I eventually moved down to Atlanta, Georgia. And I was honest with the elders. I told them, this is what happened. You know, this is why I was put on public reproof. Well... One of the elders, he looks at me, he shakes his head, he says, that's the most absurd thing I've ever heard in my life. And they very quickly lifted my public reproof because they thought that it was just stupid, which it was. Yes. Okay. So I was, I was in Atlanta for nine months, and I became the good little witness again, you know, zealous. The whole thing came right back once the, the reproof was, was lifted. 
and an opportunity arose for me to move to the Virgin Islands. So I moved to the island of St. Thomas. This is everybody's dream. Sure. I live in the Caribbean. I mean, wow. Nice. This is cool. And, of course, my file followed me there. The elders from the Atlanta congregation mailed my dossier or file or whatever to the congregation on St. Thomas. And it, of course, mentioned the fact that I was on public reproof at one point and the reproof had been lifted. Well, this wasn't good enough for these elders. They wrote back to the congregation here in Pennsylvania mm. and the congregation in Pennsylvania said that the congregation in Atlanta had no right to lift my reproof without consulting them first and demanded that the reproof be reinstated immediately and they did. Wow. And I was so pissed off, you know, being this pawn in this three-way struggle, you know, between the between these three these three bodies of elders for I, watching a movie. For watching a movie. <laughs> and I just said to myself, I want out. You know, no more. Um, you know, that that incident with the, the with the mental patients had planted the seed. But this was the straw that broke the camel's back. And mm -hmm. I said, no more. Well, this is back in 1980. And in those days, I'm sure there were people who disassociated. You just didn't hear about it. Mm -hmm. Back then, when you wanted to leave, you did something to deliberately get yourself disfellowshipped. So I started smoking. And one, of, one day, an elder comes walking into the business that I managed. I light up a cigarette, and I blow smoke in his face. And, of course, I was immediately called before the judicial committee. And interestingly, during the judicial hearing, not one word was mentioned about my smoking. All they wanted to hear about was my sex life. And they didn't want generalities. They wanted specific details. Who, when, where, locations, names, the whole nine yards. Even though they brought you in? Even though they brought me in for smoking. For smoking. And not one word was said about smoking. Wow. That's not the end of the story. I was disfellowshipped for quote unquote conduct unbecoming a Christian. Three days later, one of the elders on my judicial committee shows up at my front door and tries to seduce me. Crazy. <laughs> Island fever or something, huh? Well, I mean, it's just, you know, playing by their rules. Yeah. You know, you know what they say, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Hmm. You make somebody an elder, you know, they got power over you. Yeah. And that's that's scary. Well, the you fortunate know. thing it sounds like is since you're disfellowshipped, that power is broken. That power is gone. Yes. In fact, last year on the 30th anniversary of my being disfellowshipped, I wrote a letter to Watchtower headquarters. You know how married couples, after they've been married so many years, they renew their vows. Mm -hmm. Well, I wrote to Watchtower headquarters last year, and I asked them if I could meet. If I could meet with the body of elders in the local congregation here to let them know that after 30 years I was still unrepentant and have myself re-disfellowshipped. Never heard from them. I don't know why. They never wrote back. <laughs> That's a great idea. Re <laughs> renew wanted, your disfellowship. I wanted, to, I wanted to be re-disfellowshipped. That's awesome. And they never wrote back. I was so no. disappointed. Not even a form letter. Usually, usually they have a usually, form. Yeah. I think you uh, you stumped them with that one I because did. they have a file with all kinds of form letters that they answer with, and of course they never sign and they have a stamp too. Right. So it's right. it's all, you know, there may not even be humans there. It may be run by robots <laughs> for all we know. Aren't a lot of them robots anyway? <laughs> yes, yes, they are. Well, I appreciate you talking with me this evening, Jim, and uh, having this event for friends to get together and uh, sharing your experiences. It's been a really, uh, really good time, really helpful for the listeners. I think they're going to enjoy listening and also um, be able to learn that um, from all the different experiences that were shared that uh, they're not alone. There's somebody with something in common with them, yep. uh, no matter what their issue is with the organization they're not the first and they won't be the last so uh next year come join us listeners and and even i just want to say one last thing even if they feel the need that they have to stay in the organization because of the family ties there are people out here who are willing to listen to them willing to correspond with them and won't condemn them for 
what they know they have to do. Absolutely. You know, I believe or, most of us here, if not all of us here, uh, have moved beyond judging one another. Yep. Uh, we've left that with the organization. Yep, yep. We, uh, we took the, uh, the uh, rafter out of our eyes a long time ago. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jim. Oh, yeah, thank you. Free your mind. Yes, thank you to Jim, Terry, Lisa, Ruben, those who posted comments on the message board, Facebook, and the social stream that I was able to share with the listeners tonight. I know that sharing history in relation to the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Watchtower organization, all these experiences can be a real encouragement to others who are exiting, some who wish they could exit, some who have already exited the Watchtower. Freedom of mind, independence of thought, and autonomy of behavior, they are all inalienable human rights that we're all born with, but that cults try to take away from us. Well, we have taken them back. We are free. And that wraps up Cult Free Radio number six. And to quote the television character number six from the classic epic TV show The Prisoner, I am not a number, I am a free man. We'll be back live on September 10, and in the meantime, look for podcast and t-shirt information on Facebook and JWN. This is Mad Sweeney for Cult Free Radio. Thank you for listening, and thank you to all our interviewees for speaking with us this evening.